True love. Guys, uh, you're not going to find that kind of true love in this message. But I would tell you, if you're looking for true love, start with deodorant. <laughs> Wear it lavishly. <laughs> Brush your teeth and work really hard. And say yes ma'am and no ma'am and it will get you far. But that is not what this message is about this morning. In 1 Corinthians 13, I want you to begin reading with me there in verse number 1. And we're going to take a look at a incredible, incredible passage of Scripture that defines love for us in uh, the clearest way uh, that I see in the Bible. And if you'll begin reading with me, we'll begin reading in verse number 1. We'll read down through verse number 13. And we're going to look at this idea this morning of true love. The Bible says this, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels... Have not charity, I am become as sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. Though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains, that's a lot of faith, by the way, I have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. And charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity envieth not, charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up, does not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil, rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth, beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things, charity never faileth. But whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. When I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see through a glass, darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even as also I am known. And now abideth faith, hope, charity, these three, but the greatest of these is charity. A charity is a beautiful word. It's not a word that we use all the time. A word that we would use more often would be love. So in this passage, it would be apt, it would be fitting to exchange the word charity with the word love. This passage is all about love. Can I say this morning that God is good to His people? He has given us much more than we've ever deserved. I mean, think of it. He gave us a means of salvation that will save even the worst of sinners. He's given us so many precious promises, and He stands behind every one of them. When someone comes to Christ for salvation, the Holy Spirit gives them different uh, spiritual giftings so that God can use them in His work with His might and His glory. And we see that in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7. All of these different spiritual gifts have their place in the work of the body of Christ. And they serve uh, to edify the body, to glorify the Lord. We've all been gifted in a special, unique fashion uh, by the Holy Spirit. The greatest, though, and most essential gift that God gave His church, the gift that, I dare say, contains the most divine power, is the gift of His love working in and through us. If you say, well, Jonathan, I don't really agree with that, I, I would challenge you uh, to stay tuned, to listen, uh, give me some uh, a little bit of time with that train of thought, and I believe that you'll see uh, the truth of that statement. His love was placed in us when we were saved by His grace. The Bible says in Romans uh, chapter number 5, verse number 5, And hope maketh not ashamed... Because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given us. Uh, so the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts 
by the Holy Ghost which is given us. Uh, his love working in us, displayed uh, to one another, is the greatest testimony that we can have to a lost world. The Bible says in John 13, verse 35, By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have what? Love one to another. So all men can see that you are my children. It's that great testimony of faith in the world. If, if, conditionally, if you have love one to another. And I apologize for my voice in advance. Friday night, uh, Largo High School played and they won 7-2. to two, And I was very excited for them. Joanna said, are you on the team? <laughs> ha, 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 Joanna. Joke's on you. I failed my senior year of high school and I'm the oldest senior on Largo's football team. I'm just kidding. Uh, I'm very excited for them. I'm getting to work with them this year. But a Friday night football game. And then last night, uh, I believe Brother Trent and I beat, oh, who was it, Stephen Otis or something in Cornhole. And I got very excited about that as well. And uh, Otis and Steve will be working on their game. Boom. Gotcha. <clears throat> Also, when we walk in love one to another, we're walking in obedience to the Lord. The Bible says, a new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another as I have loved you, and that you also love one another. When we walk in love toward one another, we're proving, we are showing, we are evidencing that we are saved by His grace. The Bible says, we know that we've passed from death into life because... We love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. So you see the importance here of love. You see the testimony that love is. You see the proof uh, in our own lives of what uh, love is. And that love toward one another. That love toward the brethren. We see in the Bible even love toward those that hate us. That despitefully use us and persecute us. We're to show love. One of the problems in the church of Corinth, I dare say, the greatest problem is the church in the church of Corinth was that they were manifesting nearly every spiritual gift in existence, but they weren't walking in love toward one another. The Corinthians loved the flashy gifts. They loved gifts that made them look spiritual in the eyes of others, but God was more interested in them coming to the place where they loved one another like He loved them. And I want that to be a challenge to us today. I'm thankful uh, for the gifting that God has placed together at this local church. I'm thankful for each of you that has been saved and, and baptized and uh, you've been equipped and, and called to do great work for the Lord. But I'll dare say all the use of all the spiritual gifts in the world without love is empty service. I'd like to remind you this morning that it is very important uh, to have love as we minister and as we serve. Uh, don't just do it out of obligation. Uh, don't just do it out of necessity. But let your heart be filled with love toward one another. In chapters 12 and 14 in 1 Corinthians were written to uh, combat, 12, 13 and 14 matter of fact, were written to combat the problems that existed here in Corinth related to the spiritual gifts, their usage in the church. Uh, uh, while many times we'll view these chapters as standalone chapters, we must read them together to get the proper context of what's going on here. So chapter number 12 uh, talks about spiritual gifting, why they're given to us, why they're beneficial to the entire uh, body of Christ. Chapter 12 talks about how the body is strengthened and, and blessed when individuals use the different uh, gifts that they've been given uh, by the Lord. Chapter 14 deals with the misuse of certain gifts uh, and sign gifts and tongues and healing. And contrary to popular belief, uh, chapter 14 doesn't encourage uh, the use of tongues. It actually discourages uh, the use of tongues in church and calls the church at Corinth to deeper maturity in their walk with the Lord. He talks about the order and the way that things should be done in the church and the most beneficial things to uh, do in the church. In the middle of chapter 12 and chapter 14 is chapter 13. It follows on the heels of chapter 12, which ends with the statement, but covet earnestly the best gifts, and yet show unto you a more excellent way. So think about it this way. Read it this way. Uh, you're coveting the best gifts, but I'm going to show you a much 
better way of doing things. And so chapter 13 begins to talk to us about what matters most. What matters most this morning is not whether or not you possess a flashy gift. What matters most is not how smart or intellectual you are. What matters most is not how wealthy or popular or famous or how well liked you are. What matters most is not just what you do, but why you do it and how you do it. If you don't get anything else this morning, I want you to get that. What matters most is not just what you do, but why you do it and how you do it. When you learn to love like Jesus loves, you've discovered what matters most. And this passage is all about that, what matters most. And I'd submit to you that it's true love. Look at verse number 1 uh, to verse number 3. We're going to take a look at the distinction of love. Uh, of love. The whole idea of these verses, verse number 1 through 3, is that they are distinct from, that love is distinct from, that it is uh, superior to anything we can be or do, regardless of what we do. If it's not infused with and carried out with love, it's a colossal waste of time. First of all, I'd like to show you that love is better or higher than the sensational. Look at verse number 1. In chapter number 13, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I am become a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. Listen, it doesn't matter how great your oratory is, how beautiful your speech, how brilliant your rhetoric is. Without love, you're simply a clanging cymbal. Anybody ever went and heard a cymbal solo? I can tell you it's not very exciting. And it doesn't matter what you say or how you say it or how accurate it might be. Without love, it's just, listen to me, it's just noise. It's just noise. I hear a lot of smart people talking today, but they're talking without love. And without love, talk, listen to me, talk is cheap. I hear a lot of preachers that will stand up and, man, they'll thunder down the Word of God. And they use pithy illustrations and alliterated outlines. And, man, they know exactly when you use the perfect hand gesture, but you listen to it and you think about it. And you say it doesn't sound like the love of God is even making a dent into that sermon's preparation, into that sermon's delivery, in that sermon's outflow. It doesn't sound like love plays into it at Oh, are you listening to me? And here's what it sounds like. A clinking cymbal. Because we can say all the right things, but without love, it's just a loud noise. Love, secondly, in verse number two, <coughs> is higher than... By the way, pause a moment. Let's go back here. In your marriage, in your family, in your workplace, you may have all the answers... But when you deliver them without love, it's never, listen to me, it's never going to produce the desired results that you're looking for. Say, well, you don't know my marriage. When I talk to my wife and I tell her how it is, man, she falls in. Hey, listen, behavior modification is not success. Well, you don't know how I parent. If you knew how to parent, listen, I tell them how it is. And Hey, listen to me. When they're 18, they leave your house. Proof will be in the pudding, buddy. Well, at my workplace, I tell them how it is. They know who's the boss around there. Hey, listen to me. Just because they're scared of you doesn't mean you're getting what you're actually looking for. Are you listening to me? And some of us, we say all the right things and we know all the right answers, but the ingredient that's missing is love. And while love is missing, temporary change might happen, but your desired result will never, ever be there. You say, I want a good marriage. you got to insert love. I want to be a good father. i got to insert love. I want to be a good mother. got to insert love. I want to be a good co-worker, good boss. you got to use love. You listening to me? <clears throat> First of all, the sensational. Second of all, love is higher than the spectacular. Look at verse number two. Though I have the gift of prophecy, and I understand all mysteries and all knowledge, though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains, and have not charity, 
I am... <laughs> I'm not going to belabor these thoughts. I, I, I think it's pretty self-evident. This verse mentions several uh, spectacular abilities. But even if that person was able to do all of those things, they have not love. Nothing. And thirdly, they love higher... This is good. Love's higher than the sacrificial. Look at verse number three. <clears throat> Though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor. Though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. <clears throat> Let's elaborate for a moment on that. Let's think about it. We can give away everything that we have. We can give up our own bodies on the altar of martyrdom. But if we do so without love in our hearts, it's a waste of time. It doesn't profit us one bit. The emphasis in these three verses is very, very clear. The Christian, when love is absent, the Christian's not any better than the heathen. Uh, when love is absent, in verse number two, he's nothing. In verse number three, he can expect nothing. Regardless of what other people might think of us. Regardless of our abilities or our gifts. Uh, regardless of all of those things. Without love, it is a waste of time. So the distinction of love, the importance there, I believe verse number 1 and 3, 1, 2, and 3, if we were to summarize them, it is explaining to us the distinction, the difference between love, good works, uh, between love and, and actions, between love and, and sound thought and good knowledge. It's, it's showing us the difference between love and all those things. It's saying you can have all of that, but if you don't have love, you're missing the key ingredient. <clears throat> So that takes us to the second thought there, the description of love. You say, well, I, I think I'm loving. I think I do things with love in my heart. I may not be a warm and fuzzy, uh, cuddly kind of person, but I mean, I'd like to think that I'm a, I'm a lover, not a, a fighter, right? Well, let's look at love's features. Verse number four. The Bible says <clears throat> that charity, what does it say, suffers long. We want to, to elaborate on that and be uh, patient endurance under provocation. The literal meaning of that word would be long-tempered. This is a type of love that doesn't retaliate. How many of you struggle sometimes with not retaliating to wrong? Okay, we've got four honest people in the church. Praise the Lord for you. I am thankful. Uh, I think all of us at times when we struggle uh, with not retaliating. We each have different pressure points. Maybe some of us are a little quicker tempered. Maybe some of us are a little bit uh, medium suffering, right? But not all of us are long suffering. Yeah. <clears throat> that idea of that type of love, I think about Stephen. I think about Stephen as he's being martyred with forgiveness in his heart, with heaven on his mind. And of course, the greatest example of this would be Christ himself as he forgave those that uh, attacked him, that literally mocked him and, and killed him. One of the reasons I love Abraham Lincoln so much, if you're around me any amount of time, I like a lot of historical figures. Abraham Lincoln is like one of the top of my list. I love Abraham Lincoln. One of Abraham Lincoln's most uh, outspoken enemies uh, was a man named Edwin J. Stanton. Edwin J. Stanton had this thing where he just did not like Abraham Lincoln, and he said a lot of junk. One of the things that he said about Lincoln was that he was a low, cunning clown, and that he was the original <laughs> gorilla. All right? He said it is ridiculous for people to go to Africa to see a gorilla when they could easily find one in Springfield, Illinois. All right? This guy did not like Abraham Lincoln. That tweet would have went viral. <clears throat> but to Lincoln's credit, he never responded to those insults. And when it was time to name his cabinet, he named Edwin Stanton his secretary of war. And so they asked him, they said, uh, Mr. Lincoln... You realize that he said all these things about you. Why would you choose Edwin Stanton to be your secretary of war? And he said this, 
because he's the best man. And certainly he saw him go to war against uh, himself. He knew him to be a man of war. And so he said, I choose him to be my secretary of war. Later, Lincoln was assassinated. And Stanton stood beside Lincoln's coffin and said through his tears, it was recounted by those around him, there lies the greatest ruler of men the world has ever seen. Jonathan, what are you saying? I'm saying patient love in action won over that man. We would look at that and we'd say, that's absolutely crazy. What in the world was he thinking? But Abraham Lincoln understood a principle that we do well to learn, and that is love is long-suffering. But look at, secondly, there in verse number four, <clears throat> charity suffereth long, and it is kind. A lot of us would look at that and we say, well, I've got that one down. I might not be long-suffering, but everybody says I'm kind. Kind is different than just being a nice person. Kind is different than just when somebody else is unkind, I'm going to remain kind Kindness here in this verse is active goodness. It's, it's love that moves to action, that goes to, 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 to war, if you will, or goes to action on behalf of others. It doesn't just respect others. It, listen, reaches out to them. If we were to elaborate on this love, we would have to look no further than, I believe it's Romans chapter number 8, God or the Bible speaking of God's love for us, and how He has loved us, and how He gave Himself for us. Listen, we would do well to understand that kindness is not just, not just niceness, it's taking action. It's doing something with love. It's active, not passive, not neutral. Kindness, action. The Bible says that love, uh, or charity, in verse number 4, continuing on there, it envieth not. True love's not jealous over the abilities or successes or possessions of others. Instead of being uh, jealous when somebody else does well, love is pleased when they do well. And jealousy is one of the ugliest sins in our hearts. It was Eve's jealousy of God that led her to partake of the fruit in the garden. It was jealousy that uh, led men to have Daniel thrown into the lion's den. It was jealousy of Joseph's brothers that led him uh, to be uh, thrown into the pit. Listen, jealousy is absolutely ugly. And jealousy is one of those things that can be inside of our hearts and nobody sees. But let me say, just because nobody sees it, doesn't make it any less ugly. You listening to me? <clears throat> Charity, the Bible says in verse number 4, continuing on there, it vaunteth not itself. What does that mean? It doesn't make a parade. doesn't brag. doesn't draw attention to itself for what it is doing. Love doesn't have to be the center of attention. Love's not puffed up. It's, it's not arrogant or proud Realizes that all it has, all it is, is given to it by God. Listen, we do well to understand that it doesn't matter how great our talents are, how spectacular our gifting is, everything we are and everything we have is simply by the grace of God. Would you listen to me there? Everything you are, everything you have, is simply because of the grace of God. But you don't understand, I've practiced this craft, or I've, I've spent time, I've spent attention, I've been very intentional to become very good at this. I, I deserve to be proud. You understand that God gave you the capacity to learn those things, to know those things, to retain those things. Who you are, and make no mistake about it, who you are is simply of the goodness of God. Charity, your love, does not behave itself unseemly. It's never, never rude, treats others with 
compassion and consideration and respect. Love controls the emotions. It's friendly. It's not friendly one day and then rude and unkind the next. Genuine love is love that makes Jesus look good, right? Charity, <clears throat> right, by the way, right there is when the wind comes out of the sails and man, boisterous, love is, love is, love is. And you get to that one, it's like, oh man, I got some work to do, right? Love seeketh not her own. It's not selfish. It's not self-centered. Hey, listen, it's actively concerned about what will profit others. Love's not self-serving. A lot of what we see today as illustrations of love, it's very, very self-serving. Man, who can I love and it benefit me? No, no, no. Love is, how can I love everybody? Because Christ has loved everyone. Jesus is the prime example of seeking not his own. And the Bible tells us in Philippians 2, I love the book of Philippians because it constantly takes attitudes and actions and it, and it points to Jesus. It says, what, what did Jesus do in these situations? What's the example of Christ? We would always do well to look to Christ as comparison. Amen. Philippians chapter number 2 says, let nothing be done through strife or vainglory. But in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. Listen, seeketh not her own. There was a poem that I read, I thought, read to you. It says, love ever gives, it forgives and outlives, and ever stands with open hands. And while it lives, it gives. For this is love's prerogative to give and give and give. Love, continuing on there in verse number five, love's not easily provoked. Not easily provoked. And what that means is not so much when it's pressed, it doesn't react like a bear to the provocation, right? But what it means is it doesn't keep any records of evils done to it. It willingly endures slights and injuries. That's hard. <laughs> because uh, people are mean, aren't they? That's hard because life hurts, doesn't it? I mean, that's hard because wrongs exist, don't they? I heard an illustration about a man. He was a Baptist pastor during the American Revolution. His name was Peter Miller. He lived in Ephrata, Pennsylvania. He was friends with George Washington. In Ephrata, there was another man. His name was Michael Whitman. And he, by all intents and purposes, is remembered as and recorded as a very evil man who did everything he could to oppose and not just oppose but humiliate this, this pastor. Well, eventually that came out, and uh, one day Michael Whitman was arrested for treason. He was sentenced to die. Now, Peter Miller heard about it, and he traveled by foot 70 miles to Philadelphia. Not to watch his enemy die, but to plead for his life. George Washington, when he heard that, he said, No, Peter, I, I cannot grant you the life of your friend. The old preacher looked at George Washington and he said, My friend, I came to you to beg for the life of my enemy. And he's the bitterest enemy that I have. Washington was taken aback. He looked at Peter Miller. He looked back over at Michael Whitman. And he says, You've walked 70 miles to save the life of your enemy. Well, that puts that matter in a different light. A different light, I'll, I'll grant your pardon. And he did. And Peter Miller took Michael Whitman back home to Ephrata. And as you can imagine, he was no longer his enemy, but he became a very good friend. Why? Because when most of us would like to see punishment met out, and justice dealt. Peter Miller said, 
I'm going to stand up for my enemy. That's a man who did it, keep a record of all the evils done to him. That's a man who was not easily provoked. The Bible continues on there in verse number 5. By the way, a couple of these are hitting that area in our lives where isn't it really easy to say, but it's really hard to live out. And we find that love is no cakewalk. And love doesn't happen by accident. Love has to be very intentional. Love is a choice that we make daily. But love is made easier by the gift of the Holy Spirit in us. Hey, listen to the natural man. If you're here today and you don't know Christ as your Savior, go ahead and give up on this idea because this ain't going to work for you. But as a child of God, as a child of God, and by the way, I'm not saying give up, it ain't going to work for you, there's no help for you here, I'm saying this, you need Jesus, and Jesus will increase your capacity to love, amen? amen. He will change your life, amen. He will wreck your normal, and He will bring you to a place of increased capacity for love, but as a child of God, we have to be very intentional about love, it doesn't happen accidentally. Love, continuing on there, verse number 5, it thinketh no evil. It thinketh no evil. How many times do we judge the intentions of people? And how many times do we judge even their actions? This idea is that love is seeking to think the best of others. That love is not dwelling what others, uh, dwelling on what others might have done to us. I'd say this: if this action or practice in our churches our homes, our workplaces, it would solve a lot of problems. Someone said it's natural to love them that love us, but it's supernatural to love them that hate us. Look at verse number 6, continuing on there. Love rejoiceth not in iniquity. doesn't rejoice in sin. Whether it's our own sin, the sins of others, love hates sin. And love hates when someone else falls into sin. In college, there were some guys that did not like me. I know that's hard to believe that somebody would not like me. <laughs> they didn't. And not only did they not like me, they took an active path to their dislike of me. And I had some guys that really came at me. I was given uh, some, some position in college, uh, dorm supervisor and things like that. And these guys just set their mind on just ripping apart my reputation, my life in that moment. Got really jaded, got really hurt. It was petty stuff. It was really, really petty. And uh, got really hurt, got really upset. And my senior year of college, I existed. I worked a lot. I went to colleges and I went to classes and just pretty much tried to stay awake. I had gone through three years of Bible college. I paid my way through school. I worked my way the whole way through. And uh, by my fourth year, I was just tired. And I allowed their, their dislike of me to just enter into my heart. And I got hurt and I got bitter. And I got, to be honest, very jaded. But later on, we're, we're now, uh, I guess, 10 years since I've been in college. A lot of those guys have fallen. A lot of those guys went and got into ministry and their marriages have ended. Uh, there, there were a group of about four of them. One of them was divorced. Two of them lost their jobs in ministry. Life did not end well for them. Or it, it's, it's not ended, but life has not gone well for them. I remember the first call I got that told me about that. And my first reaction was, That's what he gets. It didn't take long for me to be pretty smitten at the coldness of my heart as this guy's marriage was wrecked. And I'm sitting here happy because of a petty thing in my life, the difference that he and I had had. Love doesn't do that. Now, I had to fix my heart. I pray for that guy every day now. 
But love doesn't rejoice in iniquity. If you're in this room, people have wronged you and they've hurt you. And the truth is that sin always comes to light. And consequences are going to be dealt out. And God says, hey, justice is mine. And listen, God deals with stuff. And it may not be in the way you'd ask or your timing, but God, God deals with stuff. But when he does, don't rejoice in iniquity. <clears throat> but the Bible says that love rejoices in the truth. Then to verse 6 there. While love hates every form of evil, it loves truth. It rejoices when truth is proclaimed and when truth wins the victory. And truth, love loves truth even when truth hurts. The truth ought to be the way that we live our lives. Look at verse number 7 here. I want you to see <clears throat> the fortitude of love. So we see in verse number 1 to 3, we see kind of what love is and how love is different and supernatural and it is prominent, is to be prominent in our life. Verse 4 through 7 kind of uh, lays out what love practically should look like. But then love is explained in such a way in verse number 7 through 12 that shows us that love is not to be a flash in the pan, but there ought to be some fortitude about it. <clears throat> love's staying power. Look at it in verse number 7. Love beareth all things. Love patiently endures and overlooks the faults of others. The idea of beareth, it, it literally means to cover. Instead of parading the faults and failures of others, love covers them. It beareth them. It continues to love in spite of those things. Say, well, that's hard to do. I agree. But that's the way that God loved us. Remember that verse, we love so much, God commendeth his love for us. And that while we were yet sinners, Christ, what, died for us? You know what he did in dying? He covered us. In spite of the fact that we were wrong, we were sinners, he, he endured, he bore those things for us. In the 17th century, there was a man named Oliver Cromwell. And he was given the title Lord Protector of England. As such, he was to deal with soldiers when they were out of line. And one particular soldier had committed such atrocities that he was sentenced to death for them. And the execution was to take place the next evening at the ringing, excuse me, the ringing of the curfew bell. Next evening comes and the normal time, everybody's ready, and they're lined up, ready to execute this soldier, but the bell, bell didn't ring. They waited, and maybe it's just a one-off, and they waited, they waited, and darkness came, but the bell never rang. What had happened was the soldier's fiance had climbed up into the bell tower and literally grabbed onto the clapper of the bell to keep it from striking and ringing. So they, of course, find her, and Lord Cromwell <clears throat> sends for her to stand before him, and as she did, she began to weep as she showed him her bruised and bleeding hands. Cromwell was so touched by her love for her fiancé that he said, Your lover shall live because of your sacrifice. Curfew shall not ring tonight. Love beareth all. And when I think about that illustration, I think about how fitting that is that the one who loved took on him, or in this case herself, the brunt for another's actions and bore in her own body, her own hands, the punishment so that the one she loved wouldn't suffer. And I think about what Christ did for us and and we would be foolish if we did not see the correlation there. That love bears all things. And you say, well, it's different because, I mean, God loved me. And I'm, I mean, I'm me. I mean, who doesn't love me? You're the enemy of God. 
Your sin is an atrocity before him. Our lives are in direct violation of his holiness. We, mankind, have spat in his face by the way we live. Our very existence is in opposition to his being. And yet, he loved us and gave himself for us. What are you saying? That's the way that we ought to love. Love beareth all things, it believeth all things. We're going to move pretty quickly here. Love always places the best interpretation on things that happen. Love is optimistic. Love hopeth all things. Love says, I'm going to hope for the best possible outcome. I may expect something else, but I, I'm going to just hope that that's not the case. Some of you are in relationships that it feels like the only substance that you have in that relationship is that hope. And that hope is really hard to grasp onto, isn't it? Would everybody look at me for a moment? Some of you, you literally are living life and you have love for a person that has hurt you so bad that shows you nothing in return that all all that you're holding on to right now is hope. And it doesn't feel like it has any handles, does it? It feels like it's slipping away. And we're grasping and grasping and grasping. I can't help but think that a lot of humanity is loved by God and they don't realize the love that He has for them. The relationship that you're in or the friendship or the the, the family situation that you're in that you just can't see an end to understand this. Nothing is beyond God. Nothing is beyond God. The hope is of God. Continue on there in verse number seven. Love endureth all things. What's that mean? And I love that it comes on the end of believeth all things and hopeth all things because there are times when everything just falls apart. And that idea that it endures all things, it means this, love doesn't give up the fort. Love doesn't quit. Stands its ground against everything that's thrown against it. And continues on in spite of persecution and ill treatment. It bears the unbearable. It believes the impossible. It holds on that something incredible could happen. And it just doesn't give up. I believe this. I believe the word stop doesn't exist when we look at true love. The thing is that we grew up seeing true love as being something in fairy tales. Something that was a feeling that we just happened into. And when we first saw that person, it was love, true love, right? <laughs> I can't get the Princess Bride out of my head right now. May I just what brings us together all today? If you've never seen that movie, you're missing out on a tremendous part of American life, and you should watch that. <clears throat> Endureth all things. Don't stop. And then in verse number 8 through 12, we see that charity doesn't fail. The other things pass away, but that charity still is to exist and doesn't vanish away. It's the great constant throughout all of eternity. The idea here is not always about success, but endurance. When other things are kind of peeled out of the way, there will still be love. Love doesn't give in and give up and give out. Love that's real love lasts. I want you to take your attention to verse number 13 as we close this morning. 
the durability of love. Verse 13. And now abideth faith, hope, and charity. These three. But the greatest of these is charity. That's always been a really unique verse to me. Faith, hope, and charity. And the greatest of these in charity. The greatest thing that a believer can possess is love. Jonathan, what are you talking about? Wouldn't it be, wouldn't it be faith? No, 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 listen. If our love is right, faith's no problem. If our love is right, then, then our hope is in the right place. When our love is right, we're right. Well, Jonathan, what makes love so great? And this is where I ask you to bear with me. And here's where I ask you to really tune in. Love is the defining characteristic of who God is. And when the Bible wanted to define God in one sentence, it defined God as this. God is love. Think, think about that verse. Faith, hope, and love, right? Well, God doesn't have faith. Jonathan, that's blasphemous. Who would God place his faith in? God doesn't have hope. I mean, what would, what would one who has created all things and by him do all things exist and consist? Why would he have to hope that God is love? And so I would dare say to you this morning that we are never more like him than when we show love. And the very essence of who God is is that he is loving. You say, well, Jonathan, these are the kind of messages I, I don't like. These are the kind of things that, that bother me. These are the kind of uh, messages that kind of rub me the wrong way. Because here you are, and you're trumpeting God's love. But God's also just, and God's also a God of anger, and God's also a God of wrath. And God, hey, all of those are very true. God's a whole lot of things. There's a whole lot of definitions of God in the Bible. His names define who he is. There's a lot to God. He is a lot bigger than we can put in a box this morning. I get all of that. But when you peel all of that back, you find this one foundational truth. That God is at the very center of his essence. At the center of his being. God is love. Amen. That is the core to who he is. Everything else flows out of that. His justice and his wrath. It all comes from that one place. God is love. And God's love led him to create mankind. And God's love led him to when mankind rebelled against him to not do away with them. And God's love led him to be long-suffering toward Israel in the wilderness. And God's love spared man in Noah's day. And God's love over and over and over again. And fast forward to Isaiah when God's love prophesied that that Redeemer would come. And that there would be one who would come and take upon him himself the sins of the world and get into the gospel and be introduced to the one who was sent in love by God to be the sacrifice and sin for the world who as a baby in a manger was created just so that he could die yes. Come on. and watch God's love through the ministry of Christ and watch God and through Christ minister to the broken and to the least of these watch God in his love open not his mouth as he's accused and he's lied on and he's beaten and he's mocked. Watch God's love as Jesus hangs on a cross. Yes. And his blood pours out of his body. And then watch God's love as he's placed in a borrowed tomb but the grave couldn't hold him. And death couldn't keep him. Yep. And watch God's love as he rolls back the storm and uh, the stone and Jesus comes out. And watch God's love as he stands before his disciples and he says, Hey, listen, I'm going to prepare a place for you. But by the way, I'm leaving you all power because all power has been given unto me. And I want you to go be witnesses of me in the whole world. Watch God's love as he gives man a purpose. Watch God's love. 
as the Holy Spirit works on your heart. And you come to a place where you realize your need. You realize your sin before God. And God presents clearly to you that without Him, you're broken, you're, you're undone, you're faulty, you're frail. And He shows you, you are in a bad way. And, and watch God's love as He reveals to you the penalty for your sin. He says, you owe a payment and you can't pay it. But watch God's love as He reminds you that Christ has paid it. Watch Christ's love as you come to that point of realizing you can't be saved in and of yourself, but he tells you, if you'll believe on me, I'll be your salvation. And watch God's love as you place your faith in him and acknowledge his, his being the only one to save you. Watch his love as he deposits the Holy Spirit inside of you. And he literally lives with you. And as you go through life, he comforts you. Amen. He exhorts you, tells you when you're off, and he tells you how to get back. That's God. God is love. So this morning, do you love God more than anything else in this world? Because in Matthew 22, we're told to love him with everything we are, everything we have. And there are a lot of little G gods. This is our series on Thursdays and Wednesdays. There are a lot of little G gods that vie for our attention. What do you love more than God? Because it doesn't even belong in the same throne room. Well, God sits on the throne of my heart, but over here, no, 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 no. God and God alone, He alone is worthy. Do you love God more than anything else in this world? And then secondly, do you love God, or do you love others, rather, like God loves them? Some of you, you need this truth because you've got to work on loving that stranger and you're constantly having issues with just meeting people and just oh what's their problem some of you you need to be reminded of this because the person closest to you is that person you need the most help loving right Beth Ann? <laughs> some of you is that estranged person in your life and you're loving them maybe from a distance or You've been struggling to love that, hey, listen, God is love. We are most like Him when we love. Father, I thank you for who you are. I thank you for your goodness to us. I thank you for this reminder. God, I pray that you'd work in our hearts in ways that we cannot see. I pray that you would do in us exactly what you'd want. And God, I pray that we'd be open and honest with you. If there's one here today that doesn't know you as Savior, Father, I pray that today would be the day that they come and they place their faith in you, that they'd take you to be their Savior, that they would believe in you and have eternal life. God, I pray for the one here that's saved, that struggles to love. Father, 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 please help us to learn to love like you love. God, I ask you to forgive me of the times where my reflection of your love is woefully short. But God, I pray that you'd remind me and challenge me to love like you love. And that my love would be like what I've received from you. Thank you for who you are. Thank you for all that you've done for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you stand to your feet? Your heads bowed and your eyes closed. <clears throat>